Moving on. Okay, we're almost done with the slideshow, then I'll give you guys a break. I've got to <coughs> take a break myself. All right, let me click here and move forward. Okay, so a different way of creating a chart, okay, than the bioclimatic chart, which only takes into consideration a couple of factors, right? So what were the factors on, on Oglia's bioclimatic chart? Let's see if anybody can remember. What were the factors on Oglia's chart? Air movement is one, comfort zone is not. The dry bulb temperature, the humidity, and the air movement. That's it. Those are the three things. So those things are, the, the air movement isn't necessarily present here, okay? But there are a lot of other factors that are, pres that are present here, okay? So the psychometric chart links together a bunch of different pieces of information and shows how they relate to each other. So the dry bulb temperature we've already talked about, relative humidity. One we haven't talked about is saturation point, right? Saturation point occurs when the air has a certain amount of moisture in it, and if the air temperature drops below a certain point, we get something called rain, right? It's going to happen big time on Thursday, supposedly. Um, the wet bulb temperature, which is taken, we'll talk about that, with a sling psychrometer, no, a sling thermometer. And then the dew point, all right? And I'm going to talk about each of these things in specific. Um, also, the other things that we can do this with this is to plot where the comfort zone is, okay? Taking into consideration various factors. All right. We can also use it to say, on a given day, the temperature was this at, at 6 in the morning, this at 7 in the morning, this at 8, nah, 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 and then it went down. Nah, nah, nah. We can plot all of the hourly things for a given day. You guys are going to be doing that. All right, so um, let's start with dry bulb temperature. So when you look at a psychrometric chart, the dry bulb temperature is a scale down here. See the scale? So it's from, from 10 degrees to 110 degrees. This one happens to be an American, right? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't resist. Um, so those temperatures are drawn as lines upward, okay? So anything on this line is 110 de or 100 degrees. This is 110, 90, so on and so forth. Okay? So try to remember that one. And this, again, this PowerPoint is in there for you guys to look at. Um, this, all, these, all of these images came out of a tutorial that was put out by UCLA for understanding the psychrometric chart. Okay? And there's a strange lady that talks on it sort of like this. Yeah. You'll, if, you find, if you search for it, you'll find it. Okay, the next thing is the horizontal lines, these numbers along this side, right? Those represent the absolute amount of water that is in air. And the way it's measured is pounds of water, water's heavier than air, right? Uh, in one pound of air. So one pound of air could be a lot. You guys do realize that air weighs something, right? Okay, air does weigh something. Um, so the amount of pounds of water in the amount of one pound of dry air, okay? We don't use that one immediately, but eventually. The next one is the relative humidity. So if, if I was to draw a bunch of dots on the board, and I put them all about two inches apart, right? So I'd draw a bunch of dots. I'll do it. Dot, 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 dot. Okay? So there's a bunch of dots up on the board. Now I'm going to, and I'm going to put a circle around it. Now I'm going to do another circle over here. All right, so now there's a whole load of dots. Pretend those, those dots are molecules of air, okay? Which one has more room for other stuff, like water? The one with less dots or the one with more dots? The one with less dots has more air for other stuff, right? And so it can hold a lot more water molecules than this one. This one's going to have a harder time holding the molecules, right? 
And so relative humidity takes into account the temperature of the air and the amount of water that's in it. Okay? Remember, when something gets hotter, what does it do? Rise. Why? Because it's trying to escape. No, no. Nope. Because it's less dense. Okay? When things get hot, they expand. When things are cooled off, they contract. They get smaller. Okay? So, understand that. And relative humidity is basically taking um, the lines of water in the air and relating them back, right? You can use those to relate back to the dry bulb temperature. All right? Now, there's a special line in relative humidity, right, that is called the saturation line. The saturation line is when there's no more room for any more water in between the air molecules. Notice that the saturation line is really big in the hotter temperatures and really small in the lower temperatures. Which of those two temperatures would have less dense air? Hotter or colder? Less dense. Hotter. So over here, you can hold a boatload more water, right? But if that air cools down really fast, it's going to turn into rain. How many of you guys have ever seen uh, water coming out from under your car in the summer? Not, not out of the radiator, sorry. From your air conditioner. Well, your air conditioner is taking the outside air, which has a certain density, and it's cooling it way down. And so at some point, it cools it down to where that water gets to the saturation point and leaves the air. So, okay. Next one is this, this other one called wet bulb temperature, which relates the curving lines to the vertical lines, okay? The wet bulb temperature are these diagonal lines. See the diagonal lines? And the way that you can use them to relate things is going to be by taking a temperature and a relative humidity, okay, and finding where they intersect a line and then following that line down, okay? Um, the horizontal lines uh, are the dew point, okay? So the, that's the point at which an object, all right, in the air will condense water. So that frosty cold beer that you guys are going to drink this weekend when you leave Mount Sac, right? Or that, that frosty cold cocktail or whatever it may be. Maybe it's a nice Coca-Cola, right? If you're sitting out and it's warm out, it condenses, right? Because the dew point of the air is far below the condensation level. But you watch. If, if it's really, really cold outside, right, and you get that same cup of water, then it may not condense at all, or it may condense very little. Generally, they get all condensed when, it gets, when there's this big temperature differential. Okay? All right. So I mentioned to you guys that we plot all of these things. Um, I also mentioned that we can use the psychometric chart to plot the comfort zones. So here is an example of two comfort zones superimposed on each other laid on the psychometric chart. So notice that these two comfort zones happen to be between 70 and 75, right, or 78, and maybe they go down from about 76 to 82. I call BS on that, but whatever. That's somebody's model. Somebody, some skinny little person that doesn't get hot created that model, right? And uh, take a look at, at how it slants over based on the humidity, okay? So there is a big difference between what you're comfortable in at one humidity versus what you're comfortable at in a different humidity, okay? All right. Um, so that's one of the things that the psychometric chart can be used to plot. Um, one of the things you guys got to understand about mechanical cooling and heating, right, is that it can do three things. One thing it can do is heat the air up, in which case it's going to get drier. It's going to be going this way, or it's going to be the relative humidity is going to be going down, right? It can cool the air off. That means we're going that way on the dry bulb temperature. But as the air cools off, what happens to the relative humidity? What happens when the molecules get closer together? 
there's less room for water, right? So the relative humidity goes up. Um, the other thing that we can do is, anybody ever heard of a swamp cooler? Yeah, anybody ever been in a house with a swamp cooler? Yeah. Oh, you betcha. Um, it, depending on where you're at, swamp coolers either work or they don't. Out in the desert, in the spring and early summer, they work great. I mean, you can't, it's, you're actually more comfortable because if the air temperature outside is, I don't know, 100 and the relative humidity is like 20%, what ends up happening is your skin gets all dried out. Anybody ever get dry skin in the, in the winter? Yeah. You know why? Because that furnace is doing the opposite. It's lowering the relative humidity to the point where it's like the air is going, need water, I'm going to steal it from this person. And they take it away. But the air takes your water off your skin. Okay? So an evaporative cooler can be effective, but only in certain climates. Okay? And what the evaporative cooler does is it does cool everything, but it increases relative humidity much faster. And it's doing it through three words. What are they? No. The process by which an evaporative cooler cools things Go back to um, to change of state. Oh, latent, heat. latent heat of absorption, correct. Water is evaporating and absorbing the heat out of the air. Okay. Now, one of the this, this is one of the crazy things in in, in our world of uh, of architecture and engineering and mechanical systems. Sometimes the air is too moist. Right, and it has to be actually air conditioned to lower its relative humidity, right? And then after you remove the water out of the air, you then heat it back up to get it to the temperature you want it to be at. So now you get warmer, drier air than you would have gotten if you didn't air condition it first. It's cuckooness, but it does happen. All right, so um, this is the psychometric chart for climate zone nine. Climate zone nine happens to be where Claremont is, which is where your house is, right? Or your project site is. Um, on this psychometric chart, ignore this stuff up in here, okay? All those, those words up there, just ignore them. What I want you to focus on is all of the red dots, right? Focus on all of the red dots, and then focus on the green dots inside of that little chart, in that little uh, graph. What do you guys think that blue line is? We've already talked about it, sort of. What? HTC. HTC? Is that like THC? No? It's the, that's a comfort zone. Correct. That is a comfort zone. And um, the dots, what do you guys think those represent? Who's got a calculator? Anybody got a calculator? You got a calculator? So I want you to take 24 times 365, 8760, 8760 is how many hours you get to breathe air out of one year, okay, 8760, so these dots are literally plotting the daily temperatures by the hour for the entire year, the average, the, and that's, that's an average year. We're going to talk about climate in just a moment, or after we take a break. So every one of these dots is an hour. So let me ask you a question. If it is 50 degrees, or let's say 55, right here, or let's even say, let's say between 50 and 60 degrees, are you guys comfortable being out in your bathing suit? You're not. This is not comfortable, is it? No, and it doesn't matter if it's dry or wetter than wet. It's not comfortable, okay? So if it is between 80 and 90 degrees and you are in a jacket, you think you're gonna be comfortable outdoors? No. no, you're not. So if you take a look at the picture of the climate, the way it looks, would you say that most of the time you would be comfortable in Claremont or most of the time you would not be comfortable in Claremont? Well, you'd be comfortable 1,056 hours out